Good greetings. Uh, my name is Kali Akuno. Uh, I am uh, working with the Institute for Social Ecology, uh, producing a new video dialogue uh, series uh, for the Institute that's going to be looking at some of the more challenging issues of our time, bringing on the best minds, uh, most principal forces on the field that I'm aware of into these dialogues, you know, to, to sharpen up things to help us give us the collective tools that we need to move the revolution forward. And today, uh, I bring to you, uh, comrade, friend, and author of A People's Green New Deal, Max Isle. Uh, Max, how you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Uh, I'm surviving, comrade. I'm surviving. Uh, given these these interesting times, you know, we are still dealing with uh, the pandemic in its full strength, uh, at least how, how it's manifesting itself in the United States, uh, in Mississippi. Uh, so trying to adjust to uh, a re reality which is very much uh, constructed by the decisions um, being made by right-wing administrations uh, that are having a deadly impact uh, on our community. So today, Max, I uh, want to talk uh, about your book and the deeper politics uh, underlying it. And one of the things I'd like to, to first kind of question you, because you know, this is a burning question, uh, at least in, uh, amongst the folks that I'm working with, is the connection uh, between uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and climate change. Uh, and asking this question because in the general conversation, it may come up or, you know, in, in some side notes that uh, particularly how farming uh, and, and kind of uh, urban expanse have encroached upon the natural environment uh, might be underlying cause, but it's been totally kind of depoliticized. So I'd like you to speak uh, uh, to, you know, from your understanding and your knowledge and research, how are these two things connected? Break that down for us. Right. So one of the things that has been uh, discovered, above all, I think we can lift up the work of Comrade Rob Wallace in this respect and his research team, is that there's kind of this destructive interaction between uh, the rise of these uh, pathogens and industrialized farming and especially industrialized livestock farming and these particular patterns of urban sprawl. And what it ends up doing is that uh, through a, it, it kind of creates vectors for uh, both the transmission, the propagation, and then the ability of the, these pathogens to uh, become communicable to humans in a very refined form such that they become highly infectious, right? Um, and this is because the, uh, you know, the, the natural fire breaks of diverse, uh, genetically diverse animal populations are kind of wiped out uh, in certain zones. They're replaced by monocultures of animals, which then become breeding grounds, like uh, kind of uh, species level petri dishes for the incubation of uh, various, various viruses, right? So this kind of then uh, allows for the spread of these viruses and then they, uh, amongst these animal populations, and then eventually often jump ship, right? They transmit from animals to humans. And this is why we keep on having, for example, the avian flus and so forth, uh, emanating from these kind of concentrated animal uh, feeding operations, these, uh, these very dense feedlots and so forth. So this is a industry that is rooted in uh, industrialization of agriculture and also very poor uh, urban planning. Or poor, uh, a, a poor regional planning on the whole, in a sense, right? And so these are also what the Latin Americans would have called styles of development, right? This is a style of development such that it ends up becoming uh, both ecologically destructive on the whole, and I, I say that in, uh, I highlight ecologically destructive on the whole, uh, and I hope we get into this more because I think the dominant tendency is uh, to reduce the ecological crisis to the climate crisis. I mean, this is a dominant tendency. Mm -hmm 
uh, across the left is a, is a very reductionist mode, which is kind of like uh, kind of economism, but in the form of ecologism, right? And it, it's short circuiting a lot of uh, political questions. So, but to bracket that for the moment, right? Uh, it is uh, this kind of industrialization, this st this uh, this style of development uh, industrializes agriculture and also um, uh, and industrializes it in this form where it's creating these kind of homogenous uh, animal product animal populations, and they in turn are fairly carbon dioxide intensive uh, and methane intensive. Not as much so, not in the same way that's often reported in the mainstream press, but they end up uh, uh, converting kind of animal agriculture from uh, or uh, the pr production and consumption of animals for human use, which has been going back uh, probably hundreds of thousands of years, right? Uh, into something that is actually no longer nestled more or less smoothly into the surrounding non-human ecology, but actually becomes enormously destructive to it, right? Um, and it, uh, it, lead, it, it creates these very concentrated toxins that uh, we saw a lot when the hurricanes were hitting the East Coast of the United States a couple of years ago. We saw these floating animal carcasses, these uh, manure lagoons, they spread everywhere and it's a highly toxic uh, stew of manure. Uh, it's also even more toxic because all the uh, all the antibiotics going into animals. A lot of a lot of this ends up in the animal byproducts, and then all of this works its way into the aquifers and the water tables. It causes a huge, huge amount of damage, and then it also is a huge portion of uh, a sizable portion at least of human greenhouse gas emissions, right? Um, and so it, we see the and we see kind of this particular form of industrialized capitalist animal agriculture as a convergence point between uh, both COVID and uh, or the source of COVID and also the climate crisis, which is, of course, we should always keep in mind, just a portion of the broader ecological crisis. Yes, yeah, I'm um, glad you, you brought up this particular piece about the styles of development, right? Because there's a particular style of uh, response, which uh, I would argue has been instituted uh, in the, the overall course of uh, trying to save the economy, I think is a typical argument uh, that's being thrown out there relative to, to kind of COVID-19, but it's embedded within a particular logic, right? And a particular style. Um, so what, I, what I'd like you to touch on, you know, and to, to break down, uh, if you could, uh, Max, uh, is the style of development uh, sticking with that theme uh, that's been that's being propagated by the mainstream uh, use of the Green New Deal, particularly by ALC, which you know is the one that has the widest currency, uh, the widest reference, uh, of which I think still there's there's more put onto it than what uh, by the left in particular uh, than the actual substance of what was written and what's being proposed itself. Uh, and it represents a particular way in which um, capitalism is, is intended to be preserved that I think uh, it's not being highlighted enough, right? But it's in, in, in part embedded in these kind of systems and logics of development. Uh, so if you can break some of that down with a particular focus on, you know, why is this particular narrative being pushed at this time? Right, right. So to start, we, we have to have an idea of what capitalism is, which might seem obvious, but I only say that uh, because it's not necessarily clear that everyone, and I don't mean you and I are necessarily even the listeners, but I mean probably people who are more of our antagonists, you know, everyone doesn't agree on what capitalism is. This is part of the problem, right? So if everyone doesn't agree on what this thing that we're confronting and opposing is, then of course, you're gonna have different ways of actually confronting it, right? You're, per, per force, you're gonna have a different strategy. So, of course, you have people who think capitalism is, you know, uh, got a little extreme uh, in terms of its neoliberalism in the last 40 years. But, like, that's something from 1945 to 1973 when the U.S. was uh, wiping out, uh, you know, 15% of the population of North Korea, that this, this type of capitalism is something we really should somehow get back to, or at least uh, there was nothing rotten at its fundamental core, right? Um, or, uh, you know, so it, it's this kind of, uh, or, you know, or the the New Deal period and so forth, when, uh, right. when, the, US, when the U.S. was just uh, 
uh, engage in all sorts of processes of uh, uneven accumulation and uh, transfer of value from the South throughout that period as well, right? So these people want to kind of create this as this kind of halcyon dream world that we want to get back to without questioning, okay, so they're kind of like, well, you know, capitalism is basically, they conceive of capitalism in its extreme neoliberal orientation rather than thinking of it as uh, both rotten at its core, but also always, even in its so-called golden age in the West, a system that rested especially on uh, worldwide polarized accumulation, it's the, the accumulation and so-called prosperity that existed for some populations in the core, which I also don't need to uh, go on too much about, but it's very clear that that prosperity was also racially dispersed, um, that actually that so-called prosperity always rested on the underdevelopment of the periphery. So this polarization is natural. You have internal polarization within nation states, and then you have systemic polarization between the core and the periphery, and that polarization is based on the transfer and theft of actual one lives to uh, labor hours. So labor hours are constantly being transferred. Resource use, right? So resource use has always been unequal in the core and the periphery, and especially relevant for our purposes, uh, access to the carbon dioxide reservoir. There's been a process of the process of uneven development has also been a process of actual uh, enclosure and primitive accumulation of the sinks for carbon dioxide, right? And a particular development path, or you could say this particular Northern style of development, which really burst into, you know, it's full kind of nightshade flower uh, post 1945, with widespread suburbanization, widespread car culture and so forth. And then we saw in the sixties the uh, and seventies and increasingly later, these kind of upper middle classes of the periphery as well, uh, were trying to get access to this style of development as well. And as they became kind of broke off from any sort of uh, adherence to uh, national popular investment uh, and kind of just kind of grafted themselves onto the core's accumulation cycles, right? With all the attendant ecological effects, uh, which especially also included in terms of productive relations in the periphery, a shift of industrialization from the core, meaning the wealthier states uh, the U.S., Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, a shift uh, of industrialization from the core to the periphery, especially it's most the most polluting industries, right? So this kind of style of development on the consumption side, uh, highly technologically, highly, uh, great deal of technology, great deal of cars, uh, highways, um, high energy density, televisions everywhere and so forth, also meant that this process of industrialization, which at least went with some benefits initially in the core, uh, for the working class population, when it went to the periphery, just kind of met this massive uh, destruction of health and livelihood and very little growth, actually. Brazil is kind of taken as the example or as the, the golden child of, the, of this period. And actually, Brazil at this point was getting incredibly polluted, massive destruction of the Amazon, massive uh, uh, favela or slum growth uh, around the Brazilian cities, uh, massive devastation of the Amazon, not to mention, uh, you know, just absolute sub-fascist killing of uh, entire swaths of dissidents in, in Brazil during this kind of so-called golden period of, uh, uh, of when it was acquiring the style of development in the 60s and 70s. So I say, I historicize all this to say, when people talk about going back to anything, we want to be like, what do you want to go back to? And do you have a sense of what the problem is in the first place, right? So then, um, you know, this kind of, so when, uh, you know, Ocasio-Cortez is basically, and, you know, along with other figures, unfortunately, like Naomi Klein, are, are very much putting forward this narrative that, uh, you know, hearkening back to the New Deal. They're like, okay, Green New Deal, let's harken back to the New Deal. And basically the idea is we're going to have a social democratic renewal in the United States. And of course, this has a certain logic for people in the United States, including like, uh, you know, all kinds of suffering people who are not doing very well, clearly and also want to secure some kind of future for their them, themselves and, and, of course, their children and grandchildren and say, okay, we really do need to do something about uh, the climate crisis, right? And so this is the kind of sentiment that this idea of a Green New Deal, uh, both in its kind of very skeletal uh, sense put out by Ocasio-Cortez, you know, she's kind of doing, she's kind of on the Instagram influencer. I mean, I, I don't know, she's not really putting forth a lot of ideas lately, uh, but... Uh, put it forth by her and then kind of bandwagon by a whole swath of kind of social democratic uh, 
intellectual disorganizers, right? Who who immediately were like, okay, yeah, this is all feasible. Uh, Ocasio Cortez put forward the idea. Bernie is going to be the one to implement it. Boom, Green New Deal, 2021, zero emissions, 2030. How did that go, right? That didn't go very well. I mean, that that whole uh, sequence, of course, was uh, anyone could have known in advance. Anyone could have known in advance that it was going to collapse uh, historically, and of course it did. It was it was totally wiped out from history stage, right? Now the idea is, of course, uh, at its core, right, is is to do those things while also maintaining this kind of polarized accumulation that I was talking about, right? So it's a new style of development that's going to retain a lot of the old style of development, both in terms of its limited access to development for the great majority of the world's population, uh, massive pollution for most of the peripheral population, uh, but it will possibly resolve at least the portion of the ecological crisis that's called the climate crisis. And will do so, they imagine, by swapping in the immediately CO2 polluting uh, aspects of uh, the productive base and, and uh, swapping them out and swapping in renewables, let they be uh, lithium, cobalt, whatever, windmills, um, Hydro, um, massive hydropower, and so forth. And even though we know that, you know, these are not, uh, th there's no technologic, there's no socially innocent impact of any technology, right? So uh, they kind of want to say the technology itself is more or less good. We just need to swap it in. Whereas instead of saying, okay, everything is going to be fraught with a power struggle, a class struggle, and it's going to be embedded in a context of uh, of, of the prevailing power relations unless those power relations change. So this idea kind of hegemonized amongst a large portion of you know, what passes for the left in the, in the United States, uh, maybe less so Europe, where um, th there, are, despite the same kind of imperialist predilections, there is a kind of, uh, at least on the ecological front, I think the, um, you know, not necessarily for uh, reasons of interest in third world sovereignty, but there's kind of a, a little more nuanced thinking often about the ecological issues. Now, so this idea of what was hege hegemonized is this idea of basically a social democratic Green New Deal and uh, based on cheap access to all the necessary minerals to carry out the, the transition um, and basically based on a permanent energy apartheid in the poor and the periphery. Um, and so you can kind of find this stuff, um, you know, you saw people like uh, Robert Pollan, who's a supposed leftist economist at UMass, writing along with, of all people, Noam Chomsky, right? And they're arguing, yes, they say, based on this study by this guy, uh, Jacobson, that you can actually carry out a full renewable uh, transition in the United States by 2030. You dig a little bit into that report, right? And uh, Stan Cox is the one who carried out this research. You dig into it, you realize that that report, uh, if, if you, once it's scaled up globally, uh, which they also did, is based on permanent per capita disparities in access to energy from like Haiti and India or Bangladesh to the United States on the order of 10 or 15 times more energy use in the U.S. versus these third world countries. So you're basically saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to maintain these kind of permanent disparities in per capita access to the world's commonwealth, which is energy, right? We're going to maintain that, those disparities on a north-south line, and that is how we're going to accomplish green transition in the now, this uh, is understandable why something like this occurs. I mean, this is the history of the Euro-American left is a history of right-wing deviations into uh, support for development in one place and underdevelopment in another, right? So one understands historically why that happens, but folks who are actually internationalists and say, okay, everyone in the world deserves more or less the same level of development, which I hope is the type, you know, which are the type of people we're in conversation with. People who think that need to say, okay, I don't want anything to do with the people proposing that type of Green New Deal. And it's very difficult to imagine a dialogue because they imagine that this type of uh, basically apartheid, for example, in energy access, they imagine that that is fundamentally okay. And we imagine that as fundamentally not okay. So, uh, you know, the dialogue is difficult because the values are, are not uh, identical. Yeah. That was a little I mean, wandering. The, the, sorry, the, sorry for that. <laughs> there's a little um uh hit your camera off for a second and turn it back on, Max. I think there's a disruption with the with the line a little bit. Uh 
but the signal might be a little weak. Okay. Uh, on my end, you still look a little bit frozen. So we'll 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 just keep going. It may not be like that on the on the on the stream itself. Uh, okay. But we'll just keep going. Um, so building building on that, uh, I want for the sake of this audience, and I know you've touched on it well. Um, you know, uh, in the book and in a couple of different places. But I want, before we go into to a couple of different points, I want, if you can, to really break down uh, the Coach Obama process, right? And, and uh, the documents and declarations that came out of it. Uh, I, like you, believe uh, there's still the sharpest things that have been produced, uh, but uh, I, it's been jettisoned. Now, I want us to talk about why uh, it's been jettisoned because I think that's very important. And I don't think, uh, you know, the rise of the Green New Deal kind of dialogue in the United States and in Europe takes place in the in the very context of this profound process being undermined and jettisoned. Um, uh, and it gave this in kind of impression that, uh, you know, the folks who kind of came up with these iterations, both in the United States and Europe, uh, we're coming up with something new, you know, like off the cuff or brand new and this whole new set of kind of radical ideas and proposals. But in, in reality, it was in the context of rejecting one set of ideas being advanced uh, on a broad international level or something that was much more palatable to their own kind of respective nation states and their own particular styles of you know, implementation. But I want for the audience uh, for you to really break down how that process came about, um, you know, and what were the, the kind of the central tenets of it and why, you know, it, it's kind of the tip of the spear uh, uh, in your view. Yeah, one second. Sorry for that. Um, I hope you can uh, edit that out. Okay. Um, okay, so this is fundamental, right? And um, the the Cochabamba People's Agreement kind of uh, emerged out of a long-standing uh, principle in, in environmental uh, uh, legal negotiations about the environment, going back to 1992, right? And this is kind of something that had been pushed by the Third World, is this idea of, uh, which is so important, right, uh, of common but differentiated responsibilities of uh, nation states, right? Um, and, I, you know, I hope we can bracket kind of uh, the complexities of, of the nation state, but there's the international legal system. It, it, it works through nation states, that's broadly, uh, of course, in other ways too, but that's the primary vector it works. That's what's, that, that's what's on the table. So this idea of common and differentiated responsibility basically meant that there's a common responsibility to deal with the environmental crisis, but that responsibility falls on different people and different groups in different ways based on their different histories, right? Something that totally is, is completely uh, rational and makes a lot of sense to any normal human person who doesn't have a vested interest in kind of obfuscating uh, this kind of basic common sense principle, right? Which was enshrined in uh, the international, uh, international uh, convenings about the environment, it's the Rio summit, right? So uh, a lot of the wrangling in subsequent, you know, the, in the international climate uh, conferences going forward, practically uh, since then, has been the U.S. and uh, European uh, imperialist states and their settler offshoots trying to reject this idea of common and differentiated responsibility as the operative principle for uh, global climate justice, right? Uh, because if that is taken seriously, it's very clearly understood that uh, actually it's very that countries' different responsibilities would mean that the South is really not very much responsible. 
and the North is overwhelmingly responsible. And I can go into some details about that, uh, the way the numbers break down a little later on as well, if you want to flag it. But what's fundamental is that this idea, this fighting over this was just, uh, the North basically wanted to eliminate this reasonable idea from history, right? And the North is much stronger. So it, uh, it's, it's generally, it's often able to do so, but not always, right? So at Copenhagen, 2009, they really tried to just ram through uh, an accord that more or less rejected this idea of common and differentiated responsibility that uh, rested on a lot of voluntary uh, reductions in CO2 emissions and, forth, and so forth. We can say same old, same old. It was blocked. It was blocked by the Latin American radicalized states, right? Bolivia, uh, Venezuela, uh, at the time, Sudan was also involved in blocking it, Cuba, and um, I think Nicaragua was also involved in blocking it. But of course, the, ma the major mm -hmm. actors, and you have to remember, this is 2009, like Venezuela and Bolivia were like uh, champions on the world stage of what they were doing internationally, not just for the environment, but for a lot of other things as well, right? For, uh, for Palestine, for a, a myriad of things. They were doing fantastic work on the, on the international stage, a lot of which has uh, been summarily erased from the conversation. So. Uh, Evo Morales, who incredibly has been concocted as someone who's actually against the environment, put forward a call for a uh, people's process, a people's meeting that would on its own uh, have been an alternative to this kind of top-down uh, Eurocentric uh, Copenhagen process. And there were, uh, so that was in, uh, in April 2010, uh, I don't know the number, but some hundreds of civil society groups, especially from that, but far from only from Latin America, um, came together to draft, uh, put together one, a series of working group statements, but also a declaration on the rights of Mother Earth and also uh, clear demands for quantifying uh, the climate debt owed from the North to the South in accord with this idea of common and differentiated responsibility. They said, okay, there is a common and differentiated responsibility to deal with the climate crisis. The responsibility of the North is to pay us for destroying our world, right? And to pay us so we can survive the coming storm, right? Um, so that was broken down into a couple elements, right? You had the, the emissions debt, that is what the core had emitted beyond its historic uh, right. The adaptation debt, what the South needed in order to, uh, uh, to adapt to uh, do okay with climate change. And the mitigation debt, that is to tamp down the damages and pay for the damages from uh, the, the coming storms, right, and the storms that were already in place during that period, right? Um, and the, the statement eventually settled on 6% of northern GNP. Um, so I did the math. I mean, that comes to around $1.2 trillion a year from the U.S. or $3.2 trillion from U.S., Europe, um, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, right? And I urge people to keep that in mind keep those numbers in mind and keep that 6% figure in mind. Because whenever you hear people talking about the climate and they are talking, wanna, wanna try and raise this issue of North-South and they're not talking about climate debt, our question should always be, why not? And they might say, it's not reasonable. It's like, well, if you have a platform, who decides what's reasonable? <laughs> but it's crazy. Like anything could be reasonable. Uh, I mean, okay, you know, the, the sun uh, the sun going the other way in the sky, that's unreasonable. But we're talking about human-made things. These human-made things can be made reasonable if enough people try and make them reasonable. That's also known as a revolution, right? So do you agree with the politic of uh, that emanated and was uh, deemed legitimate by the entire, by a huge representative swath of the Global South or not? And do you think they made reasonable arguments for these payments or not? Like for me, of course, the answers are clear, but I think, uh, you know, I think w what's urgent is for uh, people all over, you know, wherever we are inserted into the world to be defending those positions because otherwise, uh, you know, the majority world is going to be uh, destroyed by, by climate change because there are resources available to adapt to it, right? And so these are provisions for, you know, and they, they lifted up a lot of things that, um, you know, I, I, I survey in the book, right? They they uh, they lift up things like food sovereignty. They lift up uh, co-development of technology, free technology grants. But the most uh, they they lift up the fact that, and they were brilliant in their rhetoric on this. They pointed out that who can say that the U.S. can't afford a trillion dollars in aid, uh, you know, untied aid, not like U.S. aid, uh, to the South every year when it spends a million dollars a year on its military. I don't actually know if that six percent number was uh, decided in part precisely to match up with U.S. military spending. 
But uh, be that as it may, right? There, this is a, a beautiful point. How come the U.S. has six trillion, uh, you know, one point two trillion dollars to wreck the world, but doesn't have one point two trillion dollars a year? To fix the world, right? This is actually a political decision. So they're saying, okay, if there's a transformative obligation related to climate change, it can't just be on the South. Okay, it's on you guys in the North. Like, why are you spending money? You, you, your nation, which is a, you know, more of a regime, is making a decision to allocate social resources in this way when it could be allocating social resources in a different way. That is a political decision. And I think what Coach Obama was so brilliant is to put that on the table as a political choice, right? Rather than being something that's naturalized. It's no, like a kind of mountain range or a valley or a Grand Canyon of you know, hellish domestic climate politics, you know, a kind of a naturalized as a, as a natural feature of the domestic political topography. No, it's a political choice, right? It's made, even if people feel powerless about it being made. Now, what happened? Now, what happened to it is something I myself have been trying to figure out. I do not uh, necessarily have the full answer from 2010 to 2016, but I want to say Naomi Klein wrote an article in The Nation saying that this was the best program that had been put forth so far, right? She openly defended these demands for climate debt from uh, Cochabamba, right? She was saying these are fantastic, right? Um, you know, and I think... Um, I think a lot of it probably got, got dropped in this kind of reconstitution of the U.S. left, which, uh, along with you know, what's called the Arab Spring, um, and uh, these kind of uh, these kind of quarrels that were inserted often from above into the U.S. left and um, into these kind of often meaningless debates about you know solidarity and internationalism, whereas. Uh, you know, and, and this walked kind of hand in hand with these kind of proxy operations against Venezuela and Bolivia, right? Um, with, uh, you know, destabilization, accelerating processes of delegitimization within the global north, uh, operating against these governments to the point that they, uh, by 2012, people were referring to the Morales regime. Um, and what kind of regime was it? I mean, it was one of the most democratic uh, countries in, in the world, right? Along with the Venezuelan government, you know. Uh, with uh, with all their faults, but these are extremely, on a, on a political level, extremely democratic governments, right? And these kind of governments uh, face massive crises, um, and uh, you know, in terms of their legitimacy within the global left, which I think was part of uh, pushing back probably against the Cochabamba process and what it represented, right? Um, and so both of them were kind of alchemized into these opponents of the environment, right? People are like Venezuela and Bolivia really have a huge environmental crisis. They're they're uh, you know, doing a lot of malfeasance when it comes to the environment. So I just find it shocking when I hear that. I'm like, well, the environment, there's only one planet. I'm gonna, uh, you know, we only have one planet. It's shared. And like these actors are acting bad when it comes to the environment. Like, do they, you know, do they emit all, 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 the, car all the carbon dioxide? I don't think so. Right. So it's, uh, it's shocking to, to, that this happened. Right. So, you know, um, by, uh, you know, and I think a lot of this had really passed from consciousness uh, through a kind of these maybe a de-skilling process um, uh, over, over the years. Um, and then with the, you know, the announcement of the Green New Deal was just wiped. It was wiped out. Right. So these and uh, these people are like, yeah, this is amazing. There's an eco-socialist Green New Deal on the table. Um, and we're not really, you know, of course, the North owes the South some kind of obligation, but we're not really interested in discussing how much quantifying it. That's not really what's necessary to discuss right now, right? So um, th this is kind of the tableau that we're in front of, right? I mean, you have a kind of conspiracy of silence in a lot of the Western left when it comes to these uh, climate accords, right? When it comes to the Cochabamba Accords and when it comes to this kind of keystone demand for climate debt that came from the Cochabamba Accords. And there's one thing uh, before we get to your next question that I want to add when it comes to the Cochabamba Accords. And I always am telling people this, one of the best things about the Cochabamba Accords, I can't say one, a good thing is that it was implemented because it's not, but a good thing is that you can put that thing into Google and you can go read it and learn about it yourself and you just go read it and print it out, right? That's like should be the takeaway, by the way, from this podcast is go learn about that because that is an incredible document which was both technically and politically sophisticated and also had a very wide range of Global South support, uh, including and was supported by the Global North Learn about that and why. Learn why that isn't the basis of our current climate politics, and as and that's collectively again make it the touchstone of our climate politics. I want to go back before moving on. I want to go back to something you said. Now, um, the 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 piece 
about the the process, the culture mama process, and in, in uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. I think being associated, in particular, with Evo, um, and how that was then subsequently challenged. I agree with you in 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 part there. Um, uh, what I don't think I've, uh, I'm glad you mentioned, what I don't think I've given enough credence to, and I want you to elaborate a little bit, bit more on this, is the, the role of the so-called Arab Spring in delegitimizing the process. Uh, now that you mention it, I, I'm seeing it, you know, um, um, but so much of, of you know, uh, what's forgotten, I think, from the narrative is, you know, one of the core kind of underlying reasons why that that process erupted, you know, uh, throughout the region, you know, North Africa and, and Southwest Asia had to do with drought, had to do with rising food prices, rising oil prices, um, uh, and then the shift in the states themselves as a result of that process. So break that down for us. And then there's another set of questions I got on that, Max, because I think what I don't want us to do, let me put it this way while you're thinking about that. Uh, I don't want to short skirt the the uh, responsibility of the movement actors, irrespective of the states, right, in the nation state players, uh, because it was the left here, forces that me and you know, um, who should have been pushing this agenda regardless of whether, you know, uh, the, the Bolivarian process was able to continue uh, or, you know, uh, uh, whether uh, Evo was going to remain in power or not on the basic merits of the, the program itself, you know, not figurehead leadership or associated leadership. And that particular piece was jettisoned. And I think it was jettisoned in part because of the own, the, the, the left in the United States and Europe, but particularly in North America, I should say, not just the United States, United States and Canada in particular, um, what now poses as the left, largely being concentrated in nonprofit organizations or NGO organizations or things related to that and deeply related to liberal foundations uh, and, and the, uh, the Democratic Party, either as some adjunct to it or some group that's trying to influence it. And I think that had a major impact on uh, not only not wanting to be associated, but in dropping certain ideas, again, because folks kind of deem that, well, this is not practical. Well, practical to who and who's setting the agenda, like you said, who's, who's setting the agenda, who's setting the tone? It should be us based upon what is actually needed to, to move the process forward, I would argue, as opposed to what our handlers and enablers and and you know, would be masters deemed to be uh, uh, acceptable. But this this connection, I want you to speak on a little bit more so we can we can dive into that. Right. Well, I think part of, of what you're saying is is opaque, but I think that opacity is, is opaque to actually know about precisely. And I think part of not knowing about it precisely is itself a reflection of a, uh, the left becoming a kind of revolutionary actor. So let me explain that. Like, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, if you go, if we go back, uh, I forget the exact date, right? But in sight, uh, 1996 was it, or 2006? Produced this beautiful book, right? The revolution will not be funded. Early 2000s, yeah, early 2000s. Early 2000s, right? Um, we pr produced a critique of the NGO complex within the left, right? Um, and and here we're bracketing academia for a second, although I have words for academia. But um, the point is that something like that. Could not be written right now, right? And something like that isn't being written right now, right? So we don't have any developed, mature critique of the role of the foundations and the NGOs through which they funnel their agenda of the role they play in environmental organizing, Palestine organizing, you could call it racial justice organizing, abolition organizing voting rights organizing, uh, economic rights organizing, right? These documents, not only do those documents don't exist, but I swear you have, it, it, you, you don't have anything like that 
you will have very little inquiry into the very public role of even the right wing foundations, right, in, in this process. Like, uh, what what is the economic the climate agenda of Gates? What is the climate agenda of World Economic Forum? Mm -hmm. What is the climate agenda of Goldman and Bloomberg? Right, very little of that uh, on the left. I mean, you know, I I, I spent a lot of time researching that. Uh, for my book, but it was just one chapter. It's it's relatively thin, right? Frank, speaking frankly, like other people should be doing that, right? Instead of defending the Ocasio Cortez Green Deal. Now, finally, there you know, there's a culture on the left where people are like, if you list the concrete actors who are actually carrying out this sequence, which is actually part of a class struggle, right? People will be like, that's conspiracist thinking, right? Or people will put those those three uh, parentheses around. Oh, that seems a little anti-Semitic. I swear to God, this has happened to me in conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, how uh, is 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 the Gates Foundation Jewish? Like, what are you talking about? Right? I'm just like lost. I'm like, how did you even make that step? And then I'm like, okay, you know, you're a product of confusion. You're a base of flotsam of confusion that's being carried around on big currents. But I'm registering it as a real problem, right now. So we don't even, I, frankly, I don't have a good account of this, how this process has occurred within, uh, within the environmental NGO movements and the way this occurs. I mean, I do know that, uh, yeah, it's been very clear that there's been a, you know, they say, okay, you stop talking about climate justice. Um, and, you know, because you need, you also need a movement. So there's been multiple prongs that run. I mean, one, as I'm sure you know very well, there's kind of conspiracy of silence when it comes to the Cochabamba People's Agreements overall, right? And probably a lot of money went in in order to suppress that. Right, that's one thing that people need to be self-conscious about because you know uh, it, these uh, we can't. It, it's not appropriate that uh, these NGOs set the agenda. It's also not appropriate they set the agenda for uh, for Palestine work, for that matter, which I'm, I'm more involved, I'm involved mm -hmm. with. Also, like we have to push back against this uh, process of where they set the agenda because who pays the piper calls the tune, right? They are not setting an agenda that actually reflects the needs of uh, poor humanity, right? It's just not. It's obviously not the case. Otherwise, their funders would pull the strings. Now, that's one thing. I mean, uh, I think that there, the, the sequence that I'm a little more familiar with when it comes to this process of kind of setting off these mm, kind of these like uh, glass bombs of, uh, of confusion, right, within, uh, within what passes, uh, has come to pass as, as the North American left. Right, is that you have these, all these places that just their job is doing to do ideological disorganization. They're doing ideological confusion. I mean, I think a major vector of that was was the Arab Spring. I mean, got to the point we were debating whether it's okay to to bomb Libya. It's like okay, whatever you think is going on in Libya, the U.S. did not have the right behind Qatar to send in its forces to carry out a proxy agenda there. That is something the U.S. does not have a right to do. It does not have the right to exert military or financial, diplomatic, etc. power over Africa. That's that's just like a very clear principle. Uh, and, uh, it's not even a radical principle. It's actually a liberal principle of uh, adherence to international law, right? And, and non-intervention procedures, right? Um, the, the, the process of the Arab Spring really upended these things to actually say, uh, to bring us back to the early 2000s where it's like, okay, if you just uh, were saying, okay, I have a non-intervention position, you became an apologist for one or another regime, right? Um, and uh, you know, I saw this was this was extremely aggressive, uh, this process, right? Um, and and so because a lot of the internationalism of the North American left is very flighty, right? It's like attaching to these kind of th these uh, bright objects that are streaming across the atmosphere, right? So they're like, okay, they, you know, it's focusing on one thing, focusing on another. That's one thing. You know, another is this process of delegitimization of of uh, Morales and uh, and uh, Chavez, which considerably worsened once uh, uh, Ma once Maduro became uh, president, I think, uh, because of it was hard with uh, Chavez's intense charisma. I mean, a part of it was also the fact that these governments actually supported the sovereignty of the various Arab and uh, West Asian states that were then and have continued to be under siege, right? The Latin American leadership actually supported the, so the sovereignty of those states against the U.S. imperialists. So. That's another issue. So there was a widespread delegitimization operation of that within a huge, huge consolidated layer of 
the left and especially this downwardly mobile left that uh, kind of became cultural producers within academia, journalism, and so forth to the point where, uh, you know, it, it kind of these, uh, it suddenly became very controversial to actually be thinking about these issues in, uh, in a dialogue with the demands of the South. And at the same time, is this extremely, this fairly right wing when it comes to international affairs, social democratic current really gained Right, it it suddenly burst into the burst into the sun, starting in 2015, 2016, with Corbyn and Sanders campaigns. Right, it was really set the agenda for huge portions of, of the domestic left. And if it was silent on climate debt, then that left was going to be silent on climate debt because it conceived of itself and was well rewarded for being the salespeople for that social democratic project. A social democratic project, which I understood historically why it emerged, uh, but. Uh, it was important to maintain, I always, I think, a critical distance from it. And also, even if one was in sympathy with people who were like, yeah, like, this guy wants to offer me free health care. I don't have health care. And, I, you know, my mom has cancer. Like, I can, I, you can get, understand why someone wanted to get behind a social democratic project in that context. But also people should have been much more critical than they were, right? Um, so, you know, I think we, we throw together all this mix and we just have a historic decline of internationalism, which really... Uh, despite all of its uh, ineffectiveness in some ways, right, not in others, from 2001 to 2010, was at least able to uh, have, uh, have a clear stance, right, and set up a clear pillar of opposition to a lot of the U.S. agenda. I'm thinking right now also, uh, and this is something that I think we need to encourage others to kind of look at, um, Number one, I don't think there's been a good assessment of uh, the last decade overall, right? Uh, uh, this month is the 10th anniversary of uh, the Indignados and the Occupy movements, all right? And how little analysis and fanfare and review of that, and how it impacted politics, uh, how, you know, particularly the Occupy uh, section of that uh, really gave, uh, in my view, rise to the to the trend, uh, the social democratic trend that gave kind of a, a, a animus to to Bernie Sanders. I think we need to look at that very uh, critically for all of its uh, impact uh, over this last uh, decade. A good portion of it, I think, has been deeply regressive um, and reactionary. You know, quite frankly, uh, that I think we need to kind of uh, uh, assess. Uh, and put in kind of a, a deeper perspective if we're going to learn and be able to deal with the challenges coming, you know, going forward. Um, now, the last question for the day, Max, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna, I know your time is uh, a bit short. I want to bring you back for another session to get into some other pieces of this actually and, and go in depth. Because I think um, uh, it definitely requires it. I will say now before we get off, uh, I definitely want everybody who, uh, is listening or will listen uh, to pick up the book and read it um, uh, and think about since, since you know, within this audience is going to be mainly people in the global north, uh, think about what is our particular role in being a transformative element in force in alignment with the broader demands and organizing efforts of our uh, comrades uh, uh, in the global south, right? That's a particular challenge that we have to figure out. Now, in line with that, the last question, at least for today, uh, a, a lot was left off the table, but we'll definitely come back to it. The um, COP26 is coming up, you know, in November. So this bringing it back to our, our first question uh, around uh, the impact of, of, of COVID-19, right? So the, the COP26 is supposed to be taking place uh, in Scotland. Um, there's already uh, very clearly baked in the process of exclusion of those from the Global South into the dialogue process, even more than it normally is, uh, hmm. just on the basis of uh, access to, to the vaccines, uh, having uh, vaccine passports, and then having the finances to be able to stay basically a month is what the process is, is kind of clearly calling for. If somebody wants to come in a month of uh, coming in, uh, excuse me, a week at minimum of 
of folks coming in and being quarantined, if you're from the global south, uh, to be able to participate. And then I think a week before you, after you leave, they're requiring folks to, to uh, uh, before they enter. So uh, you're basically requiring anybody who wants to engage in the process uh, to be there from the global south anyway, to, to be there an entire month uh, at their own expense, you know, at their own expense. But this is all taking place in the context of this recent report put out by the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, where they basically, you know, uh, admit to what most of the most clear science has been articulating for well over a decade now. Uh, but they clearly admit the clock is ticking. And if there aren't some actual concrete agreements that are set with timelines, which I think is one of the, the, the clearest thing that came out of that, it's got a, a lot of other weaknesses. But in the context of, of that, I think there's a deep question of the clearest articulation from uh, the UN and the national nation state process. Uh, and then these these climate negotiations, which don't have any binding contract to them, uh, but this is is at this juncture of the road, uh, deciding you know the fate of of humanity. The question I think Max is, you know, uh, where does this report, this ICCC report, I, uh, IPCC report, uh, what does it fall short? And it's falling short. What does that mean in terms of uh, movement building within this kind of uh, cop cop ongoing process? And for those who are not familiar with the cops, try not to use acronym, you know, for the sake of the argument. Uh, uh, it's the climate change negotiations process that the United Nations uh, has been uh, organizing basically since uh, 1992 on the heels uh, of the Rio uh, climate summit, which took place uh, uh, in Brazil. Um, so if you can speak to that, Max, uh, um, you know, just briefly, because I think in line with, you know, where we were talking about Coach Obama and that being abandoned and this now, this process still going forward as if none of that document, none of those things existed, you know, none of these demands exist, it's still going forward and we are still relating to it. Where are we falling short right now? Right. So the uh, technically speaking, um, there the document is more or less more of the same, right? I mean, these documents are are more or less similar. I mean, you know, certain portions of the science get more consolidated from document to document. Um, the, the document is, you know, it basically says if we don't, uh, you know, if we don't get our trajectories under control in the next 10 years, which there's a very small chance of, right? Uh, then um, we're definitely gonna, you know, have a, a catastrophic uh, increase in, in climate that will, you know, at the very least imperil most of the South, if not most of the globe. So, but we knew this, right? I mean, I, this is the important thing is both we knew this and we knew that like there is, it is possible technically speaking, to carry out processes of shifts in northern and southern production and consumption and uh, uh, social structures, social power, that the worst of it could be avoided, right? And that the more or less things, it could be a bumpy but possible land, right, on the trajectory which goes from it overshoots 1.5 Celsius for 20 years uh, to 1.6, and then for another uh, period of time, say 20 or 30 years, to get back to 1.4, by the end of the century, right? That's that's like the most optimistic scenario, which is uh, okay. One can say it's eminently survivable, right, uh, for for most of humanity. Uh, now, of course, our forces are not in a position to push that. Period. Right. That's the fact. Our forces are not in a position to to push that. Right. And it's good. A, it's good as question to ask one why. Right. And that's kind of what we've been having this discussion. Right. Um, why is that the case? I mean, part of it, I think, that, that keeps on being sized is that the, the U.S. left has not been able to offer any uh, type of meaningful solidarity to those forces in the South that are fighting U.S. imperialism and domestic capitalism, right? Uh, or just U.S. imperialism, right, uh, from, the, from the vantage point of the state. 
the U.S. left is not in a position to, and has not wanted, uh, and in, in fact, often finds itself opposed to those things, right? Say, the, the rural insurgency in the Philippines, for example, is mercilessly attacked on the U.S. left. This is just an example. And so, so is uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, right? This is a huge crisis, right? How can you possibly have a worldwide front of anti-systemic forces when the anti-systemic forces, which are problems because they're human and it's in the nature of humans to create flawed things, um, it, it, how can we have an anti-systemic front if we reject them as too flawed to be part of our front, right? So we have a front of academics and NGOs. That doesn't sound like a way to change the world. Now, you know, I don't, I think uh, I think whatever happens, uh, I think there will be a lot of pressure um, at these negotiations to force through uh, some form of emissions reductions. I think they will be at the expense of the South. I think they will be at the expense of climate debt repayments. I mean, I think I saw uh, the Prime Minister of, of the Maldives on, on social media saying just a couple of days ago, saying that uh, you know stop stop complaining about climate debt. Like we need to get an agreement. We need to get an agreement. Uh, okay, let's get an agreement, and and that includes climate debt, right? Um, and then there was a lot of pushback, including from his like, I think his own former advisors were like, "You sold out, whatever." Right. I saw um, that. So it was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a surprising exchange in some ways. Now, I don't think we can expect much. I mean, I think that um, you know, I think we need to we need to reconstitute. We need to. Okay, you know, if we just are saying we need to get something out of this, we're not going to get it, right? Um, and not only what we're, what we're going to get won't be any good because there isn't time, and it takes a long time to build up the kind of front that we need to build up, right? It, it needs to it's take time to rebuild uh, an international front in a principled way that can embrace the actually existing as opposed to dream world anti-systemic forces in the South, like let alone the forces that are not at all anti-systemic yet embraced as anti-systemic, right? Like, sectarian or funded by, uh, you know, that are, that are funded by the U.S. and so forth, funded by USAID and so forth. Now, so what is to be done? I mean, I think people, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ideological struggle, which sounds, uh, might seem evasive, but like, you know, I think people locally, I think people locally in, in places like the U.S., I think there's a lot to do. Right. I think there's a lot to do, especially in terms of disaster resilience. I mean, I don't need to tell you, you know, a lot about this, you know, a lot more than I do. But like, you know, in uh, in New York in the last storm. Right. It was very clear, like people need to hear about these kind of low tech, uh, non commodified ways of disaster resilience, of water absorption. Right. That uh, channel public spending in ways that make everybody's lives better. Right. Um, rather than this kind of decentralized disaster response that actually causes a lot of harm to, to people and actually even kills people, right? Because there is no, or there is no disaster response, right? And then people die in the basements of tenements, right? Um, this should, these should be rallying cries, you know, so there is a way, like, it's, so it's not a question of counterposing this ideology of internationalism against what to do locally. There's a lot to do locally, right? And a lot of people are involved locally, but the, the question of what to do locally can't be, uh, can't be used as an uh, excuse to just hold in kind of stasis this question of actually building towards an internationalist horizon under the idea that what's important is that there are these people suffering here. So we're going to put to, we're going to sidestep or we're going to postpone that discussion about ideology. You know, that, that discussion is academic or sectarian. Okay, well, it's actually the banner of most of humanity for a certain period of time. So it's unclear how it became sectarian, right? We need, to, we need to be able to have those conversations and bring this stuff to the table in order to build internationally for, for those of us who want to, right? Well, let's, let's stop there for today, Maxim. I definitely have to bring you back because I think the next section of, of what I'd like us to go uh, much deeper on um, is, you know, uh, uh, kind of a analysis of what we can do much more concretely right. uh, and uh, kind of a critical interrogation of some of the projects and work that are currently being done for us to kind of reflect on that, right? As uh, uh, a reflection of how we can uh, build a people's Green New Deal, right? What is it going to take to get us there? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's going to be tough. Well, well, nothing less than, than what's needed, I think, at this point. Uh, if it was going to be easy, it would have been done already. So <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> All right, well, so let's end there. Uh, Max, I appreciate your time. appreciate you, uh, you know, um, writing this book, doing this intellectual work, uh, trying to provide the movement with as much clarity on these questions as possible. Again, I want to encourage uh, everybody to uh, pick up the books by Pluto Press, People's Green New Deal. Uh, and we will try to have Max back uh, next month. Uh, and again, we're going to be doing more of uh, uh, this series uh, with the Inst Institute for Social Ecology, uh, taking on many of these challenging questions. So uh, be on the lookout for us uh, every month. If not uh, more so, we're going to be trying to do an intermittent one um, in either to today or within the next couple of days, depending on where uh, folks down in Louisiana and Southern Mississippi are at, uh, that deals with uh, a people's response to uh, the immediate crisis of, you know, uh, Hurricane Ida and now uh, uh, the recent tropical storm, which just passed through uh, and uprooted some communities again and some of the efforts that are being done uh, there. And what are some of the lessons in terms of organizing that we want to communicate to folks uh, and what we have to do going forward to build a real political movement uh, that's going to, to uh, uh, up in the systems which keep perpetuating uh, this madness. So be on the lookout and join us. Uh, thank everybody for your time. Max, again, thank you and catch you again soon. All right. Thanks so much, Connie.